The Army of the United States in 1812 was not the capable mainland fighting force that it is today. Instead, it suffered from many issues such as logistical errors, outdated equipment, poor tactics, and poorly trained troops. Although the war did actually help promote leaders such as Andrew Jackson to national hero, it would also help promote a need for, well, upgrade within the army. The initial successes within the 1812 campaign, as well as the 1814-1815 campaign, would also create some of America's most greatest generals. Now, that raises the question, how exactly was this army structured? And that's exactly what I plan to tell you today, so without further ado, let us get into it. To understand the exact condition of the Army of 1812, we must first retreat back around 37 years to the Continental Army led by George Washington. It was officially established as an organisation on June 14, 1775, and the Army was originally founded by men who had previously fought with the British Army or the Colonial Militia. As the war continued, however, the Army began to receive aid, troops and general support from the French Army, which began to shape it as an organisation. Furthermore, Prussian support came in the form of Friedrich Wilhelm von Stauben, who taught Prussian army organisation and battle tactics. However, though after the war, the army would be disbanded by the Republican government, who were distrusting of the large standing army in favour of state militias, with the exception of a regiment protecting the western frontier, as well as West Point Arsenal. Though many would begin to see how ineffective this was, as westward expansion would eventually cause clashes with natives and thus promote the need for a standing army. With the humiliating defeat at the Battle of Wabash, there were more than 800 Americans killed. The regular army was reorganised as the Legion of the United States, which established in 1791, was eventually renamed to the United States Army in 1796. It was clear with the declaration of war on the United Kingdom in 1812 that the army was definitely improving with its quality, though held much of the same lackadaisical qualities. Moreover, it managed to capture the old territory of the Northwest and Lake Erie in 1813. The army followed this would siege parts of western Upper Canada, such as York, before de defeating Tecumseh, which caused his Western Confederacy to collapse. And with this brief but, you know, interesting history, let us get into the physical rank structure of the United States Army between 1780 and 1821. The Commander-in-Chief, unlike the Lieutenant General, was actually used within the War of 1812 and this was because it was considered inappropriate or incorrect for an officer to hold a rank equal or as high as the General George Washington, an issue which would not be corrected until the Civil War in which Ulysses S. Grant would be promoted to the rank of Lieutenant General. George Washington was promoted to the rank on June 19, 1775, assuming command over the entirety of the Continental Army. Today, the title is reserved for President of the United States, with the title being Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy in the United States. Henry Dearborn, Jacob McComb and Andrew Jackson were probably the most notable Commanders-in-Chief, apart from maybe George Washington during this period. The rank insignia consisted of three silver stars on a golden shoulder epaulet. The Major General was the highest regular rank that an officer could hold. Interestingly, Generals would often be ranked instead by date of promotion rather than by the rank itself. This caused much confusing during later conflicts, notably the Civil War. A Major General could command anything from an army of several corps to a corps of two or more divisions or a division of two or more brigades. A corps would often contain either US infantry, cavalry or artillery, unlike in smaller units of command. Lastly, the rank may also hold a position such as the Surgeon General, Inspector General or Judge Advocate General in the United States Army, though proper code of conduct was not put in place till Lincoln's administration. This produced great American generals such as Winfield Scott, Jacob Brown and William Henry Harrison. The rank in the insignia consisted of two silver stars on the golden shoulder epaulets. The Brigadier General was the lowest general rank that an officer could hold within the US Army and still is up to today. Its position of command was far smaller than the Major General in that it could control a brigade of several regiments. Notably, it was uncommon for a brigade to house combined troops of the US Cavalry, Infantry and Artillery. Normally numbers would be placed around 3,000 to 6,000 soldiers, though due to attrition of disease, desertion or combat fatalities means that this number would often dwindle. The only officers to hold this rank continuously throughout the war were Edmund P. Gaines, Alexander Macomb, and Thomas Sidney Jessup. The rank insignia consisted of one silver star on the golden shoulder epaulets. The 
The rank of colonel within the US Army was normally very rare due to the small nature of the army. However, much like during the Civil War, the War of 1812 saw a rapid increase in the recruitment and promotion to the rank of colonel. Colonel's Command, the unit known as the Regiment, made up of usually three to six battalions, however many of these colonels were dismissed and discharged after their units were dissolved at the conclusion of the war, hence the addition to the title Colonel of Volunteers rather than Colonel of the Regular Army. The rank insignia consisted of a double blank shoulder gold epaulet. The rank of Lieutenant Colonel was very similar to the superior rank of Colonel. This is because it held many of the same commands throughout the war and often held executive office of a regiment. As its superior, this rank saw much inflation during the war, and the rank insignia did consist of the same double blank golden shoulder epaulet. The rank of Major would normally be in charge of a battalion or in extraordinary circumstances a company. Nevertheless, in the Revolutionary War, a Major typically served as the third officer of a regiment or as a battalion commander if the regiment was tactically divided. It held the exact same rank insignia as the Colonel and the Lieutenant Colonel. The captain was the most senior of the company officers within the United States Army and would normally command a company of infantry, battery of artillery or a troop of cavalry, approximately commanding 30 to 90 foot soldiers if they were in charge of the infantry. The rank insignia was changed after 1779 to be a singular gold blank epaulet on the right shoulder while the left shoulder was blank. The subalterns, or what was later changed to first and second lieutenant, would be junior to the captains with command over a small platoon of soldiers adopted from the British military system during the Revolutionary War period. In 1800, the United States Army Cornet, Ensign and Subaltern ranks were actually replaced by a lieutenant. The rank insignia was a singular gold blank epaulet on the left shoulder while the right shoulder was blank. All I could find were the West Point ranks were that they were known as cadet and the chevron insignia that you see today in West Point cadets was not adopted until the 1830s. Up until the creation of new enlisted ranks during the First World War, the Sergeant Major was the highest enlisted rank within the American Army during the War of 1812. The rank sometimes known as Company Sergeant Major would serve the primary channel of communication between the troops and the officers of the company. Overall, its job would be to supervise the captain's instructions for the men's care and training. Its insignia consisted of two shoulder epaulets that were both crimson. The sergeant would encompass a variety of roles within the US Army during the war period. It could carry the prefix of ordnance, who oversaw the caretaking of ammunition and weapons, or the quartermaster, who oversaw the general supplies of a company. It may also be titled as an engineer or hospital steward sergeant. The list goes on, really. Nevertheless, the rank also commanded troops in the field, as we should all know by now. The insignia consisted of a singular crimson shoulder epaulet on the right shoulder. The Corporal was the lowest ranking NCO position that an individual could carry within the United States Army. Its position would effectively be a squad leader, though this title was not official in the United States Army until 1891. The insignia consisted of a singular green shoulder epaulet on the right shoulder. The Private was the lowest rank in the Army and held no insignia nor any position of notable command. Well guys, thank you for uh, thank you for watching. It was a fun video to make, and with this series I can hopefully develop it into an 1812 to the Napoleonic War as well. Hopefully I can. Those who make it to the end of the video, thank you for watching. And well, from me, I hope you have a rest of your good day, and I will see you in the next video.